Come on, give it up for Heart Rev. God's opening a, a lot of amazing doors. Can you stand to your feet today? And if you would turn your attention to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, 2 Peter chapter. How many still bring a, a paperback Bible to church? Come on, raise it up. Raise it up in the air like you just don't care. That's awesome. No shame to the rest of you. Come on, let's hold up our, let's hold up our cell phones. The scripture says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of God, our Savior and Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Say precious. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. Say precious. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Grace is opposed to earning, not effort. So make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness. To godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their past sins. Father, we pray today. We thank you for your word. Open our hearts, our minds to receive from you what you have the power to give us. Teach us today like only you can. God, we just want to take a special moment. We've been through so much with the Chargers leaving us. So we want to thank you for the Padres in this redemptive season. In the name of Jesus. Oh, man, you could be seated today. <laughs> Turn it around, Jesus. <laughs> I um, am very forgetful of things at times because I have a lot of information coming at me. I was, uh, how many mix up your kids' names? Yeah. Imagine trying to lead a church. And someone the other, the other day, we were in the lobby, and I've known them for 10 plus years. And I was like, what is their name? I see them every week. They help watch our kids. I'm like, what is their name? <laughs> Forgetting is what humans do. Um, but forgetting cost us things. If you forgot your keys, it cost you time. Or it cost other people things. If you forgot your wallet, it cost your friend some money. If you forget your anniversary, it will cost you marriage counseling for the next couple years. Forgetting is what humans do. But the scripture teaches us when we forget what Jesus has done, we become nearsighted and blind, which means when we forget what Jesus has done, we fail to see the future that Jesus has for us. This works in church too. We come into a church and we're like, these people are so amazing. Like, I love these people. They smile at me all the time. How precious is this? And then you keep coming and you meet somebody who is not as, as precious as they impressed upon you at the beginning of your entrance into the church. And so preciousness becomes church is all right. Because we often forget. We think that the gospel is something that goes out to reach these really bad people in the world that need Jesus. But the gospel is not just for people out there. The gospel is for us right here. And we often get gospel amnesia which means we forget what God has done. So although we preach that he loves us, we don't live like he loves us. 
Although we preach that we're already chosen, we don't live like we're already chosen. Although we sing, I know who I am, oftentimes when people tell us something different, we don't recognize who we are. So when we forget what Christ has accomplished for us, we begin to lose sight. One of the things that we lose sight in is we lose sight of joy. Scripture says in Hebrews 12, 1 through 6, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, considering him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. My grandma, she passed away a few weeks ago, but the doctor came in and said, you know, you, you have about two days to live. And my grandma said, okay, well, give me something to eat. My grandma has served Jesus for many years, prayed for many of her kids, lived as a faithful saint. And when, and when the doctor came in, she didn't feel despair. She's like, okay, cool. What should I wear to go to heaven? Because she ended with a faith that still had joy. It's not how you start a thing. It's how you finish. And I want to walk into a church and remember when I thought that it was precious. And then after I get hurt, still believe that it's precious. I want to remember the vows I made to my wife five years into the marriage. When we were singing, the, the, we were doing the first dance. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. And the pictures. And the pictures and the, the moment of till for better or for worse, till death do us part. I want to remember the preciousness of that moment. But I don't want the journey to rob it of its preciousness. I want to, at the end of my life, know that my kids know that I love Jesus. I want to end with the smile that I started with. I want to end with the praise that I started with. And that is the preciousness of our faith. The preciousness of our faith is that you walked in here today and you remembered how good God was when life tried to remind you how bad your situation is. And you said, I have a precious faith that I've received through the righteousness of God. A faith that gives God glory. A faith that gives God praise. A faith that says, I'm going to trust God in every circumstance of my life. Verse 5, it said, and have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement? When we forget what Christ has accomplished, we fail to see joy in front of us. Can I tell you today, some of this might be insulting to you, but there's joy for your next season. There's some pain. I'm not going to deny the reality of there's some hurt. There's some disappointments. But I want you to look toward the joy that was set before him. He looked toward the joy that was set before him. He, he scorned the shame. He went through the suffering. But he looked toward joy. And I know it's cliche, but let me just say it for somebody that will receive it. Your best days are still yet in front of you. Let me say for this church, Heart Revolution's best days are ahead of us. We are still called to the north, east, south, and west. We still are believing that we are a movement of churches across the nation. We believe that God is going to raise up pastors in this house, and we're going to send them out, and we're going to spread the mission and vision of this house that God has entrusted us with to win families. And we have joy. We're not like, oh, God, that sounds like so much volunteer time. That doesn't sound joyful. Like, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm glad to serve. I'm glad to give. I'm glad to be a part. Because I remember I wasn't always glad. I remember what Jesus Christ has done for me. What happens when we forget our faith? We lose sight of our joy. Number two, we lose sight of his promises. 
2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 said, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. You don't need marriage to get love. I just wanted that awkward silence for a second. You need faith to get married. Because love, they say like this, love don't pay the bills. But faith produces resources for us that allow us to house the marriage we're in. That allow us to steward the relationships we have. So we have a prop today. This is what happens. When people start off with nothing, how many have ever had nothing? You start it from the bottom and you're still there. Come on. <laughs> Some of us are revisionists. We like to retell the story. We, start, we, we got skeletons in the closet. And some of them still have meat on the bones. Amen. So what happens when we have nothing, we have a measure of faith that God gives us. And we put trust in the measure of faith that God has given us. But then that faith produces overcoming victory in our life. And resources are attached to your faith. We're standing in this building by faith. Everything we've accomplished is by grace and by faith. And so when we have nothing, we have trust in our faith. That faith then produces things. So we start believing for transportation, because some of us didn't have transportation. And faith has a work, and work got a car. And we're like, look at my new truck. It's so amazing. It even has a music thing on the top. That's awesome. Some of you women, you're like, I I'm tired of being lonely. And so you had a measure of trust in your faith, but then your faith produced you an Iron Man. Come on. Some of y'all don't have enough faith, so you got a Smurf in this house. But, but we believe in for your Smurf to turn it around. Become an Iron Man. Amen. So Iron Man, you're like, it's amazing. Some of you, 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 you were job, you're jobless or you are jobless, and, and then you got a, 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 a job. You're like, it's amazing. But all this happened by your trust in the measure of faith that God gave you. 100% trust in the measure of faith that God gave you. And then what happens is you split up 50% of trust in the measure of faith that God gave you and 50% in Iron Man. And then Iron Man leaves you for Iron Woman and 50% of your faith walked out the door. And you put 30% of your trust, not in your measure of faith, but in the resource that it developed. And then the car runs and gets into a wreck. And all of a sudden, 30% of your faith is lost. You lose your job because the trucking industry goes down. And it wasn't you just lost a job, you lost an identity where you put trust in the resources that your faith actually provided for you. And so you start owning things that God called you to steward by faith. And now you felt like you lost everything. But can I tell you for a second, when you had nothing, you didn't feel like you lost everything. You felt like you had everything because you had faith. But now you start getting stuff and you start labeling that everything. That's not everything. That is the fruit of faith. And God and you in this season have walked through another place of need. But you don't need stuff. I need a job. You do hypothetically need a job. But before you need a job, you need faith to become the person that God's called you to be. To walk into a door that you couldn't open and lead a business that you couldn't think of and get a promotion that you didn't deserve or weren't qualified for. And all that happens because I'm exercising my faith. Genesis chapter 15, Abraham 
It says this, verse 1 through 6, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord, God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given to me offspring. Indeed, one born in my, ch- my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from my own body shall be your heir. Verse five, then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This is a good word. He's like, I I can't have kids. I don't have kids. And you're promising me as many stars as I can see will be the number of my descendants. Let me keep reading. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Woo, y'all didn't catch it. It's okay. I didn't catch it the first 20, 32 years of my life. But then I read it one day. And God tells Abram, let's go outside. As many stars are as in the sky, so is the number of your descendants. Woo. And then in verse 12, they go and offer these sacrifices. It says, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. When did God take Abram outside? In the daytime. You can't see stars in the daytime. So he takes him outside and says, look up as many stars as you could see in the daytime. So are the number of your descendants. And then it starts getting dark, and the Bible says the sun starts going down. And the darker it gets, the brighter the promises start to shine. And now in dark places, I could see what God was actually telling me in the light. So now the promise is not based off of what I see but off of what he said when I couldn't see it. And I had to see according to what he was saying, not what was put in front of me. So go outside, look at the sun, as many stars as you can see. I can't see any. No, see in, see in the tone of my voice what I'm saying. Imagine from your faith. Exercise your faith because the darker it gets, the more you're gonna, it's going to be revealed to you what I've actually promised. And some of us face trials and we face things in life and we have dark seasons and we're like, everything God promised, it it, it must not be true. No, everything that God promised is being revealed in the fire and it's actually showing you what he did promise was true, that he gave you faith, he gave you a precious faith, he gave you a precious promise and darkness is not rejection of that promise, it is revealing of that promise. That's how faith works. Faith works not by sight, but by faith. We don't walk by sight, but by faith. You think today I'm preaching to you, some of you for the first time. When I was 12 years old, I got keys to a church in the middle of nowhere. And I would go at 12 o'clock at night when nobody was there. And I'd turn on the sound system. And I was preaching to you before I knew you. You weren't saying amen good then either. But I didn't need your amen because I've been practicing my faith for a long time. (laughs) Exercise your faith. The Bible says godly, uh, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Which means we have to exercise our faith. What are you believing for in this next season? We're believing for more youth to come to this house. We're believing to break the spirit of poverty off this community. We believe that Heart Revolution is the home for the city. I'm not the pastor of the church. I'm the pastor of the city. You're like, oh, that's ego. No, that's faith. That's faith. Stretching and exercising our faith. Let me close with this. What happens when we forget our faith? We lose sight of his joy. 
We lose sight of his promises. And number three, we lose sight of forgiveness. Second Peter 1 9. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. The scripture said in Hebrews eleven thirteen, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The, hero, the heroes of faith in Hebrews, the heroes of faith, it said, having not obtained the promise, which means faith is not about the outcome. Faith is what helps you in life, not for the outcome, but for the relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not just believing for this and for that. We believe that faith makes us better. There's so many people I wanted to tell off this week. Some people posted some crazy stuff on Instagram and Facebook, and I wanted to comment in ungodly ways and cut their tires. I don't want to just be tough on Facebook. I want to be tough in person. I didn't because I have a church that believes in me and I represent that church. So the fact that people believe in me actually pulled the best out of me. When you believe in God, he pulls the best out of you. When you believe in God, he pulls the best out of you. And you don't do things you normally do because you represent another kingdom. Watch this. Hebrews eleven twenty. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. You know what the scripture didn't say concerning these heroes of faith? It didn't say... You know old Jacob, his name means manipulator, that manipulative guy who stole his brother's birthright, who lied to his father, who manipulated his father-in-law. You know that guy? Hero of faith. Samson made it in the hero of faith. You mean the guy that took the jawbone of a donkey and murdered people? It was a sin to touch that jawbone, the guy who went into a dead carcass of a lion and pulled out honey, it was a sin to do that. That guy who got his hair cut from his lady and all that, broke his vow. I'm like, why didn't you mention that, God? No, but Samson's faith is mentioned. Moses, the deliverer, but also the murderer and the stutterer. Moses, that guy, we're going to list him. Rahab, the prostitute? In the heroes of faith, at least give us a disclosure. Tell us about their sin. Here's here's the thing. Heaven forgets your sin because it sees your faith. And the scripture said that we become blind and nearsighted when we forget what Christ has done We become conscious and very aware of our sin. So we can't forget our sin. So we never live in faith. And he can't remember our sin because he can see our faith. Because heaven sees faith. The scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Precious is the death Death is not precious. But Peter said we have a precious faith. But what he was looking at was not the death. He was looking at the faith of the saints that outweighed the death of the humanity. And so some of you, you don't feel like you have faith. You don't need to feel like you have faith. But the fact that some of you, that a widow would come here and lift up her hand and say, Jaira is a precious faith. The fact that you're going through a divorce and you showed up today and you lifted up your hands and you said, God, I I don't have much to give. I'm just going to give something. That is a precious faith. 
The fact that you don't have it together and you still are addicted, but you're like, I'm going to fight with every ounce of my being to keep showing up. I don't know how to get out of this addiction. I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to believe that God's going to help me out of this some way, somehow, sometime. That is a precious faith. For the teenage kid that, that, whose parents don't come to church, but they're like, I, I want to go. I want to serve. I, wa I want to know God. I want community. That is a precious faith. For those of you who barely had enough gas money to come today, and you came, and when you came here, you said, I'm going to do it by faith. That's a precious faith. For some of you who've been praying for years to be healed in your body, but you're not healed, having not obtained the promise, you still have a precious faith. For some of you that's been betrayed and disappointed, and things have happened in your life that would cause you to not believe anymore, that is a precious faith. How could you ever be in a relationship when every relationship you have has been dysfunctional and hurtful and painful? And yet you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. A How could you ever trust anyone in your life again when you've been let down by the church and let down by your parents and let down by your kid, let down by everybody? How could you ever do that again? Peter said this, we who have received, he was reminding this group of people who were getting swayed by other doctrines, he's saying, we through his righteousness not our circumstances not our willpower but through his righteousness we've received a faith he didn't just say faith he said we received a precious faith a precious faith when Romans said we've been adopted as sons whereby we cry Abba Father. Abba Father in Greek doesn't mean father, it means daddy. But in Aramaic it means dada. It is the language of wonder. But so many times what is precious to a child becomes inconvenient for an adult. You see a dog, you see a mess. But a child sees a wow wow. Yippee yo, yippee yay. Your kid's squirting the water hose and playing in the water right before church, right before you got it. And you're like, this is a mess. This is ridiculous. What are you doing, child? But the, the kid, he sees wow wow. You see H2O. They see wow wow. They don't even see one. But as you grow, you become calculated, and life loses its preciousness in exchange for calculation because water now delays me. You don't see the rainbow in the water. You don't see the preciousness of a child playing in the water. You see a mess that's inconveniencing your life. Childlike faith is faith at the core of its preciousness. Childlike faith says, I trust my dada. Some of you, well, I believe in my heavenly father. Father God, we come before you today, Lord Father. If my kid calls me father, I want to spank him. I think it's illegal now, apparently. But. Father, can you give me some money? Father, <laughs> Father God, we command your blessings over us. For your word says in Romans chapter 8, in the Greek translation, I won't do that because people here don't know it. All things work together for the good, Father, to them that love him. You know what the problem with that heart rev church is? They don't go deep. They just don't, I need something that's so deep and calculated that my doctrine paralyzes me in my deepness. I want to go so deep that I feel like I drown in the Holy Spirit. 
and you lose the preciousness, the preciousness of gathering together with people. And you miss people walking by you who came with a story of God's grace. And you miss the embrace of people. And you miss the moments. When is this worship song over? They know we have lunch. They know that. What a rude church. They know our schedule. We go to bed. The kids go to bed at 8 o'clock. If you have one kid, you do that. If we have two, we don't do that anymore. One, one kid, it's 8 o'clock. Two kids, it's like whatever. <laughs> and we lose the preciousness. You, through his righteousness, have received a precious faith. A childlike faith that says, Dad, Dad, I'm going to trust you and depend on you and believe in you. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled brings life. So even with a sick heart, with an acknowledgement of my disappointments, with a lack of understanding of, of what's happening in my life, a dream fulfilled, I have faith for a fulfilled dream in my life. A precious faith. That little baby girl that you had, what, what, wasn't she precious? That, that baby boy, he was so precious until he hit 13. I have a three-year-old, and every night I say, am I your best friend? He say, you're my best friend. Then when they get a certain age, you're like, I'm no longer your friend. I'm your father. I'm your dad, dad, daddy, father. But in our faith, we have a friend in Jesus. We have a father, a dada, a provider. And may we never lose wonder for this life that Christ has given us. May we never lose the preciousness. As Peter said, may we not become ineffective and unproductive. Not in the task we do, but in the relationships we have. A precious faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, even as you minister to our hearts and minds, a preciousness of faith that we don't take for granted. You are pleased by our faith, not because you need our faith, but we need faith to walk out this life. We need faith because it makes us better husbands. We need faith because it makes us better parents. We need faith because it makes us better humans, better neighbors. You're not pleased by faith because you have an ego. You're pleased by faith because it gives us a quality of life in you that we can't produce on our own. Can we stand? Can we stand this morning? The preciousness of faith is not something you earn. It's not something you achieve. It's like, you know what, that was a great message. I need to really step up my faith game. I need to really, like, believe. I believe, I believe, I believe. They cut me off. I don't believe. A faith that we receive through righteousness. How do I, how am I aware and how do we accomplish this faith walk? We receive it. How do we receive? If I had a water bottle and I start throwing it on you and I'm like, receive, receive the water. Receive it. You're like, yes, it feels good. I have faith all over me now. This is amazing. We're going to go on a faith week and a faith walk. And then the faith dries up. The way you receive is you open it. You become open and you receive. If you're closed, you can't receive. But if you say, God, 
in my heart, in my mind, in my life. I receive this faith through your righteousness. Would you take this moment, whether it's lifting your hands, putting your hands on your heart, and begin to uh, talk to God and let God talk to you. Let the Holy Spirit begin to minister to you. That still, small voice. The preciousness of faith. The preciousness of a faith that we receive today. We receive faith in this house. Faith for the future. Give faith for your future. Faith for your future. Through the midst of depression, faith for your future. Through the midst of discouragement, faith for your future. And know who I am. every eye closed today if it's the first time or the first time in a long time you want to receive Jesus I want to say a prayer with you the Lord's been speaking to you throughout the service I want to know who I'm praying with if you could just throw your hand up at me I want to say a prayer over you God bless 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 you come on God bless you God bless you God bless you you're already chosen God bless you God bless you I want us all to repeat this prayer with every eye closed. It's more than a repeated prayer, it's a repentant prayer. Today, the prayer only has power because you're activating faith through righteousness. It's beyond words, it's in the spirit realm where you are receiving by faith. Everybody repeat after me, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I ask today, God, that you come into my heart and my mind. Be my Lord and Savior, my Father and friend. From this day forward, my life will never be the same. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, give God a hand clap and pray. I'm already loved, I'm already chosen. That you spoke in. For those of you that got saved for the first time today, we're gonna have a, uh, a key word for you to text or we're gonna have leaders available for you to minister to you. But I wanna take the next couple minutes, the next couple minutes, if anybody wants prayer, um, you want us to come into agreement with something you're going through or you need your faith increased or your marriage needs prayed for, we wanna sing this again, but as we're doing that, we wanna invite anyone who wants to get prayed for, we'll have some leaders and pastors available for you. We want to take this next three, four, five minutes to really just minister to those who 
needed. Amen? I'm already chosen. I'm already chosen. There you go. I know who Come on, would you I give am. God the praise? I know what you saw.